Good morning, everyone. I'm truly honored, humbled, and extremely excited to speak with you this morning. I woke up at 4.30 in the morning. I couldn't go back to sleep because I was so excited <laughs> of being with you and speaking to you this morning. What, what an amazing few days with tremendous speakers, storytellers, panelists, and mastermind sessions. It's invigorating to share this journey with such amazing, like-minded leaders. Thank you all so much. I have to give a big shout out and thank you to Dr. Nea. And was anyone at her mastermind session the other day? Wasn't she amazing? Yeah. Um, Nea, you, you touched, Nea, you touched everyone's hearts and made me realize how it's finally time to heal me, serve we, and impact the world on the next level. Thank you. Let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Be, be, before I share a bit of, of my personal story and the last story, uh, I'd like everyone to just stand up and applaud each other for being part of this summit and the Cox's Capital Movement. And, and while you're up, please give a big hug and thank you, a big hug and thank you to the people around you. A big hug and thank you to the people around you. That's in the last spirit. Thank you, thank you. On the screen uh, is a picture of my dad. My dad is 89 years young. He is the greatest spiritual leader in the Hartford community for the past 64 years. I grew up as a rabbi's son. Both my parents are Holocaust survivors. My dad is chaplain of the State Senate of the State of Connecticut. He's the chaplain of the Hartford Hospital System. He's rabbi emeritus of two congregations. He has written 15 books, and he's the hardest working man at 89 years old out of anyone I know. He counsels people. He constantly is, is preaching and teaching and, and inspiring people's lives, and he's my number one hero and mentor. And my... My other main heroes uh, and mentors are my partners from LAS. Jeff Karp, you see these three guys on the left, I'm in the middle, the guys with hair. Jeff's on the left, I'm in the middle, and Michael Harth uh, is on the right. Um, those guys have been my childhood best friends since nine years old and 12 years old. And I wanna thank them for embracing conscious capitalism and for joining me here today. Uh, they're right over there. Can I please give them a big round of applause? As I mentioned, Michael, Jeff, and I started our business together. We hired the best valet parker we could find. He was going to business school at University of Hartford. And 39 years later, he's our partner in CNO, Mike Kuziak, who's here as well. Thank you. The four of us together built the second largest parking company in the United States. Today we have over 1,200,000 parking spaces that we own, lease, or manage. We have, we're in 38 states, 450 cities. We have over 14,500 employees as of today that are just truly amazing people. And the greatest thing I could say is 39 years later, we're still best friends and partners. Along the way, it wasn't easy. We had times we weren't sure if we were gonna make it. There were times 
where we didn't know where the next payroll was going to come from. But we did survive and thrive because of our never ever give up attitude and staying true to our core values and our core mission. From the very beginning, we realized that we're only as good as the people we have working with us and our success will be based on creating opportunities for our employees. Today we have over 30 men and women around the United States that are partners with LAS, that are hands-on owners. And everyone knows what a privilege and a gift it is to give somebody a job to help support their families and realize their goals and dreams. At LAS, we wake up every day with that mission in mind. We're a people first company. We are people over profits. And because of those core values of respect, commitment to people, honesty, integrity, and trust, we believe that we are much more profitable. Here's a short video that talks about the spirit of LAS. We've all heard the expression, it's not personal, it's business. At LAS, they believe business is personal. As the fastest growing parking company in the country, they've leveraged that mindset to create opportunities. Parking is what we do, but it's not who we are. We are a people-driven business. This is Stefan, the next superstar right here. <laughs> we have people that will take bullets for us. They'll take bullets for us because we'll take bullets for them. What word would you use to describe LAS? What would you guys say? Family. Family. It's not work, it's home. I like what I do, but I love who I do it for more. There's a lot of different traditions at LAS. One of them is hugging. You're going to greet a LAS person. You're going to get a LAS hug. I think so many organizations find out what's wrong with people. They try and correct their actions. We're sort of the opposite. We find the good in people. We find out what they get excited about and build a program of development around that. Let's give them a big standing O. Come on. People over profits. If you invest in the human spirit, then you're going to get great results. We transitioned the third largest parking meter system in the United States. For five months straight, we had 250 people nonstop. Nobody quit, nobody gave up. In our company, you have to check your ego at the door, and you have to do whatever it takes to make everyone win. And work hard, play hard, and make money. Jim said play hard, work hard, and make money. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The order doesn't matter. It all it happens. makes a big difference. <laughs> today it's like awesome who do I get to see today where am I going I mean, if I go on vacation I miss work during my, my career I probably worked on 200 250 different companies and I never saw anything like what we have here frankly all the competitors in this space do what we do but they don't do it the way we do it. thank you a lot of people ask me where does that spirit come from? Why is giving back so important? Why is creating opportunities so important? Why is giving charity so important? And I immediately go to my family story that I want to share with you. I share it with all my friends, and I want to share it with you today. The first book that my dad wrote is called Faith and Destiny. And it's the story of his survival of the Holocaust. My dad was born in a small village in Poland in 1930. And his family was one of the wealthiest families in this village. His father had a lease on the river, 10 kilometers, and fishermen used to work for him. His mother was a business person. They were in charge of giving charity in their town. They always had a pot of soup in front of their house. I was there, back there three times with my family, and it hasn't changed. It's like going back in time. It's like Fiddler on the Roof, stone houses, thatch roofs, beautiful fields and streams. And if there wasn't paved roads, you would think you were right back there 80 years ago. Well, in 1941, when my dad was 11 years old, his life changed forever. The Nazis rolled into his village, burnt down his house, gathered all the Jews they could find, 
took the rabbi of his town and 35 other people, made them wash their horses, drink the dirty water until they all vomited, dragged them in front of everyone, cut their beards, made them dig their own graves, and killed those 36 people in front of everyone, and made those 1,000 Jews walk 20 kilometers with the shirts on their back to a Jewish ghetto 20 kilometers away, surrounded with four blocks of barbed wire, and now thousands and thousands of Jews from all these different villages were living in slave labor, working for the Nazis. My dad was the oldest child. He had three brothers and a sister. Him, his mother and father, and his brothers and sisters were huddled in one room with hardly any food. They were given certificates to work for the Nazis. If you were a doctor, a nurse, a laborer, somebody could use, they gave you a certificate. But then they would roll into the ghetto unannounced and do selections where they'd gather everybody they could find, force you into a marketplace, and point left and right. If you had a family member that had a certificate, they would allow you to live and send you to, to the line to live, to work for them. But if they found a young kid or an old person, they'd send them to the line to die, and they'd build these mass graves and kill 3,000 people at a time. Well, in 1942, my dad was 12 years old. He had been in the ghetto for six months, and he couldn't get back to his family's hiding place in time. He got caught alone, forced into the marketplace. He found himself in this horrific scene. Nazis taking little babies and killing them with bayonets and throwing them like footballs, shooting people randomly, beating people. He's getting shoved to the top of the line, and he sees the pointing left and right. And he realizes at 12 years old, the only way he's going to live is if he starts asking people with these certificates to pretend that he's their son. He goes to people he knows from his village. There's thousands of people there from different villages. Will you take me as your son? They know him. They're afraid of their lives and their kids. It's written on the paper, your children. It's a real risk. They're saying no. He's getting shoved to the top of the line. He starts asking people he never met before. Will you take me? Will you take me? Will you take me? No, no, no. Right before he gets to the top of the line, there's a beautiful woman with a nursing certificate with two little girls with her. One is seven and the other one is five. She's never met him before. She looks at him and she says, if they're going to let me live with my two young girls, they'll let me live with three. Hold my hand. He holds her hand on one side, the seven and the five-year-old girl on the other, they get to the top of the line. The Nazi starts looking at her paper, and her husband's in the line to live with his paper. And he starts yelling, my frau, my wife, my kids. There's confusion. They shove him to the line to live. She saves his life. He never sees that woman again after that. Six months later, there was the final liquidation of the ghetto. They were killing everyone. He got caught with his mother, two brothers, and a sister. His father and one brother escaped into the woods, and his mother, they were holed up in the second story of this movie theater, and they were all going to get killed. And his mother said to him, I want you to live. The world is going to someday need you. I'm going to break this window. I'm going to break this window, and I'm going to throw you out, and you're going to go find your father and brother in the woods, and, and don't forget to tell the world what has happened. He gets pushed out the window. Another mother sees what's happening, and she throws her eight-year-old son out the window that my father has never met. His name is Abe Goldstein. He takes him with him, and he saves his life. My father, they sleep in the woods. They walk to the, another slave labor camp that wasn't liquidated. My father finds his brother. Abe finds a family member, a cousin that takes him. Two weeks later, my father's father finds out that they're in this slave labor camp. 
Him and his brother escape from the slave labor camp with his father, and they live in the woods for two and a half years. Starvation, disease, 40 degrees below zero in caves, partisan fighting. 80% of those people that go into those woods do not survive. He comes out as a skeleton at 15 years old with his father and brother. They go to Austria to a displaced persons camp to recover. In 1947, he's trying to get into Israel. He can't get into Israel because it's still under British mandate. And he was lucky enough to get sponsored by a distant relative to come to Brooklyn, New York. He comes to the United States at 17 years old. No money, 10 jobs, starts becoming religious as part of his experience and starts studying to become a teacher and a rabbi. Brooklyn High School, he graduates high school in one year. Brooklyn College, Yeshiva University. Now he's 23 years old and he's almost a rabbi and he goes to a wedding of some survivors of his town in Brooklyn, New York. And he's sitting at this wedding table, and there's a beautiful girl at the table. And she's telling everybody a story about friends of hers from Hartford, Connecticut, that saved a little boy from our town in a selection line. He's sitting at this table, and he cries out, I'm that boy. Where are these people? Three weeks later, he goes up to Hartford to meet the nurse that sa saved his life and marries my mother, who's a seven-year-old girl in that selection line. I want to share that story with all my friends because it inspires us to believe that anything is possible in life, that we should never, ever give up, and that miracles do happen. And when we have a chance to bring our humanity to the moment, we do it. One part of the story that I left out is that when my, father shoved, when my mo father's mother sh shoved him out of the window, and the two boys fell in the high grass outside the Kino. There was a German soldier on the corner with a machine gun that saw and heard the boys fall. He looked at my father, he looked at the, his mother in the window, and he turned the other way. He brought his humanity to the moment. So this is what the last way is based on. We have the opportunity to put our hands out and help people and change the world. About 20 years ago, a young man came to Laz. He went to a, one of our top leaders, Jim Marzi, and he, he told us that he was one of the biggest drug dealers in Hartford. He knew that if he didn't change his ways, he'd either get shot, killed, or in jail. His name was Will Cordera. We hired him, and we trained him. He was a parking attendant. He became a manager, a supervisor, and, oh, how do I go back here? Oh, that's the faith in, oh, here he is. This is Will right here. Well, 20 years later, Will is one of our top managers, our, one of our top district general managers. He is a preacher and a pastor of his own church, and he has, he helps oversee and manage the last second chance program and has mentored and hired 250 employees in Connecticut that are formerly incarcerated and returning citizens. I am fortunate and blessed to be able to spend a, about a third of my time on charity work and on boards. I was appointed by President Obama to the Holocaust Museum Board in Washington, D.C. I'm on the 
National Board of the Anti-Defamation League, the greatest organization in the world fighting anti-Semitism and hate. I'm, on, I'm honored to be on the National Board of the NAACP. And we have launched, I serve on the Criminal Justice Committee uh, for the NAACP, and we have launched, as of last April, a nationwide campaign to create one million jobs for the formerly incarcerated. One million jobs. <laughs> the recidivism rate in this country is staggering. The cost and social impact to our communities are monumental. More than 60% of the people that get out of jail go back into jail if they do not have a job. If they have a job, less than 15% of those people return to prison. We all can make a difference in this. We all have an opportunity to change the world here. I'd like, I'd like to ask for a call of action. I would like us to help ban the box together in every state. I would like us to encourage employers around the country to give people a second chance. It will change those people's lives, and it will change our communities, and it will change people for generations to come. Thank you very much. Is the mic on? I do have one last request. Um, I have one copy of my father's book. It's called Faith and Destiny. And, um, and I'm, I would like to, in the spirit of conscious capitalism and John, in honor of John and Kip, um, in creating uh, the Future Fund, I'd like to try something here in auctioning this off to conscious capitalism. And um, I don't know how it's gonna go. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. But um, I'm gonna ask, I, got a, I have a shill in the crowd. I'm gonna ask my partner, Jeff, to start the bidding. You could start low. $1,000, let's hear it for Jeff. Faith and destiny. Who's, who, who is that? All right, stand up and give them a round of applause. 2,000. This is going to conscious capitalism and the future. 5,000. 5,000. Woo! God bless you. Who's next? Keep it coming. 5,000 going once. 5,000 going twice. All right, so where is he? Where's 7,500? Raise your hand. Here we go. Thank you. 7,500, we got a bidding war. What do you say? <laughs> this is all for conscious capitalism in the future. 7,500, going once, going twice. All right! Ten thousand, is that come on, a big round of applause for ten thousand. Come on. That's awesome. That's awesome. Woo! All right. Ten thousand. Twelve five. Twelve five. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay. Here's the deal. If you would agree to 10,000, and you would agree to 10,000, I got two books. Is that good? Is that a deal? That's a deal! Standing up! That's a deal! <laughs>